we're, t we're telling a story. Um, and when our story's incomplete, because materials are missing, have been removed, um, moved even within the site boundaries, we lose the story. And of course, the fuller the story, the better the story. It's like taking a chapter out of the middle of a book. You kind of lost something. <laughs> so we ask that you do not collect and definitely do not collect on federal and state lands. Please. But if, if it's your land, your neighbor's land with permission, we don't encourage people to go help themselves to their neighbor's property. <laughs> you know, get permission. <laughs> your family, your friends, then yeah. But you could keep, if you own some of these things, you could keep them within your family. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. Think so. And actually, if you get a chance, even write the provenance um, where you got them from. Mm -hmm. You know, we got this at Grandpa's house, Grandpa's cabin in the woods, at this creek, and those kind of things, because that is definitely important to know. Again, it's part of the story. It's clear and the story is always important. Oh. <laughs> she didn't hear that. Our number, our number show. Oh, okay. There'll be a lot of that soon. <laughs> My name's Kurt Fair. I'm the Grindstone District Archaeologist for the Mendocino National Forest. So I have the east side of the uh, uh, coastal range. Uh, Barb, who's up, up, this is called the Barb and Kurt Show. I come over, she says, hey, Kurt, we have a project, and so... I come over, and she's my counterpart on this side. And our job is to protect heritage resources, which is historic and prehistoric sites, from activities that uh, happen on Forest Service lands. And sometimes that can also mean we will also test them archaeologically. We'll see if they're eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, but for the most part, that's, that's what our job is. Um, as you, I've already heard a discussion out here, is it illegal to collect from federal lands? It is. Um, um, so I don't care if you go out and you find something, pick it up, look at it, take a photo of it, take a sketch of it, put it back on the ground and pop a little dirt over it and, and uh, then, anyway, then just walk away. Um, if uh, it's one of those things that even the tribes are having trouble with right now in our areas is they wouldn't want us to leave everything. They also know that the next public to walk over is going to take it home. And so it's really difficult to, I personally as an archaeologist, I would rather leave it on the ground because I don't want to pick it up, study it, curate it. We have to send it someplace to keep it. If it's not in our office, it's in like Chico or a museum or something. I would rather leave it out on the ground. So, a little bit about myself. I have a, uh, uh, my education is California and Great Basin Archaeology. And I am a prehistoric archaeologist, not a wow. historic archaeologist. Uh, I've worked for nine and a half years on the Modoc Plateau on the Modoc National Forest. I spent 12 years in Colorado. Uh, on the uh, Pike National Forest, and I have been here almost six. So I kind of came back home. So. Uh, fun ebbing is something I do for fun, um, and I am traditionally taught. My uh, mom's great great uncles uh, asked her when I was eight, nine if they could teach me. Mom said yes. I uh, figured I'd cut myself a few times and give up. <laughs> but I still make, make tools. My mom was born on the Northern Ute Indian Reservation in 1927. So it's her great uncles that taught me how to, to do this. Wow, that's really nice. So anyway, what I have here, and so as we go through the process, back here is a, a kind of a board that I have up that kind of takes you through the steps of making stone tools. Uh, start on the far left-hand side, I think that is. Uh, is a core, comes down to kind of below that, uh, types of, from a flake and so on. Uh, kind of the same thing there in the middle to the left. Uh, different point styles on the bottom from our forest. Then 
kind of the clamshell disc speed making on the right olive oil shell beads and then some other abalone and stuff there on the far right. Also up here in front, Barb has a couple of uh, displays, one of them going through the process of making uh, a point, what size of flake you need in the process to, to flake it down, and then uh, the small chips that are produced by making the final point that's there on the far right, and then different type of materials that you can make stone tools out of, at least flake stone tools out of. And so anything that can conchoidally fracture, you can make a um, uh, arrow points or cutting tools out of. And so that means if it's like a flat piece of glass and you hit it right here in the center, when that breaks through the other side, it looks like a cone. So that's a conchoidal fracture. Um, if you've ever seen after your neighbor or kids or somebody has shot your window with the BB gun and you notice that it's a really little hole on this side and it's an expanded hole on the outside, that's a conchoidal fracture. And so stuff that could be used, this is obsidian, that's red obsidian. Uh, this is uh, dacite, it's also Igneous, it's part of that obsidian uh, igneous intrusive family. So it's this obsidian <coughs> and basalt. And, and then this is a piece of chert. So this is, uh, we're part of the Franciscan formation here. Uh, and so this is one of the colors of, of chert that we actually get is this green. That's beautiful. And we also have red shirts here. So this is actually a, a core. Actually, let me push past these around. These are actually <coughs> from here. And this is the obsidians that the Indian people were using here is, isn't really good stuff. This is actually, it has a, a I well, believe this is Kanakti. No, is that, one's, that one's Borax. Borax -like? No, that's Kanakti, yeah. That's Kanakti. So Barb, one of my presentations, I said, hey, Barb, I need some glass from here so I can show people what this stuff <coughs> looks like. And so this is stuff that Barb brought to me. Um, and it has fitting crisp or sugar nodules in the interior. It's not really good glass, but this is what these people had um, um, here that, that's local for them to work with. Off of Bottle Rock Road. Um, some of it is finer and um, was used and is better according to the Native Americans. Um, but this is what we've got now that I can collect. Um, again, I have to get permission to ask about collecting. Uh, other obsidians uh, in Napa Valley, St. Helena has a better obsidian source and it's a really black or really black gray obsidian. And that was traded up here and on our sites, on our forests, we find both, both uh, Clear Lake local stuff and the stuff coming up from uh, uh, St. Helena. But we're also getting glass from northeastern California, it's like Grasshopper Flat, Medicine Lake Highlands, and even the Warners. Is, some of that glass is even being traded. Coming down to the... Traded down. So that's what we have. So you go, where, where, where do you start? So you've noticed I've been kind of playing with stuff out here. Oh, so it's after two o'clock you can start. Oh I already did. <laughs> so do you the want whole me to introduce or I guess you know. <laughs> <We've been laughs> <okay>. is that <laughs> this is gorgeous. We'll thank the library for inviting us at the end. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. I'll edit the back. <laughs> so this is a piece of mahogany obsidian. Um, this is what it looks like when you find it on the surface. This has a cortex on it. This is just what's been uh, uh, weathered. And that's what it looks like when I hit it. It's this really nice orange red glass. But my plan here is I'm going to hit it on this edge and then try to take a flake out this way. 
And you didn't say, well, why don't you have glasses on yet? And I'm not worried about this as much as when I'm working my hand and flaking really small chips. So, so this is a hammer stone. This is what I'm going to strike this with. This is actually quartz. I've had this for quite a while. You can see it's been pretty well battered all the way around. So we'll see if this works. And it's not taking off as much as I'd like to see. I'd like to see a larger chunk come off into here. A little bit better. Every rock is any work as you want, and this one sure isn't because I have this really odd internal fracture that's happening here, and that's what's happening is there's already a break inside the rock, and so it's not letting me actually take a really nice nice flake out, out, out of the center. And usually that also starts affecting the rest of the piece as you try to work on it. And what I'm doing here, this is called a braiding. It's roughing up this edge, so this actually has a striking platform or place to, to hit. Ooh. Just don't try to cut your neighbor with that. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is quite sharp. And what I'm work, trying to do is make a uh, something large out of this piece, but we'll see what happens. Does that hammer stone have to be a special material? Special? Usually a harder material than the base material, but you want to have enough give that it's not dang shock and put and it fractures into your, your base material, oh. into the obsidian or chert. And you see all this down here. Um, Barb said, you hadn't, I hadn't cleaned this up since the last two times I did this, which is true. But we also talk about what we see on, on our sites. And so that's part of the, the debitage that we look at is we uh, go out in the woods and, and look for sites that need to be recorded, protected, and, and just the material on the surface tells us what's going on there. Like, are they use, using local materials? Are we finding really small flakes versus um, the larger flakes? Which kind of tells us what they're doing out there. Or is it just a hunting site where they, you have a bunch of points that are broken and they're making new ones and then they're going to uh, uh, disc discard the broken ones and put in new ones. It is easier to make a point or a tool, a lithic tool, than it is to make the shafts for the arrows or the shaft for the atlatl, the spear to throw. Um, there's more time needed and preparation, so when a tool breaks, they'll often just discard the tool and retrieve the shaft because that takes the more time to, to make and to uh, build um, when you break them. Yeah, like they're, I did. They're very important. <laughs> They break. So that piece that Barb has is actually a, a drill that I made, but it takes eight hours. Even after you go out, you you cut the the shaft. That happens to be spice bush, that's a native plant here, or wild rose or something. You have to let that dry. You have to cut it in the fall or winter, so it doesn't dry out and split. So there's a lot of 
of uh, just preparation and then to get it straightened and like that is at least eight hours just for one. Wow. Yeah, that shouldn't have broken like that. I, I, st I still have that internal fracture that I've been dealing with, with, with all of this. And I haven't gotten a really good piece that I can make anything. This is a, so I've just switched hammers on you. So this is a hard hammer or, or a hammer stone. And then this is actually a moose antler billet. So this would have gone out of his head this way. And it's rounded. So this is what they call a soft hammer. And I heard stuff land over there. Yeah. <laughs> That's why this tarp's down. And I'll say we'll try to catch 90%, but I'm sure there's going to be some that escape. Yeah, the shatter. Um, in talking about terminology for the lithics, um, Francois Boards in France and uh, Don Crabtree in Idaho uh, were working on the idea of replicating tools to see what was being made, what was being manufactured, how they were being manufactured over time. And they got together and they've established the terminology that we use today so that some of our terminology, debitage, the waste flakes, the residue, the shatter off of that is uh, French. So some of the terms, if they sound French, they are. <laughs> um, ultra passe, where a flake is hit hard enough, where the pressure goes over and produces a hinge break on the other side and gives you a very odd curved flake. Again, French, with the different types of tools. But they um, were both working on it and then got together. And it, the tape of them together is just really incredible. Where can one see that? Oh, I don't know where they are now. I know there's some in Idaho. There's a couple of tapes at the University of Idaho. Um, and um, Siobhan has it. Be careful. Did that one? Yes, that one went <laughs> flying. my head. Uh, <laughs> Alrighty, I think I'm putting this down. Yeah. This, this uh, one's not cooperating very well. <laughs> Yeah, let's go get a different piece to work on. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I have a question. Were there specialists or did everybody do their own? I think both. 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 Because they talk about people in like the northwest coast, California, that specialized in meter long, three feet long ceremonial blades made out of obsidian oh that are gosh. like that wide. Uh, they're, they're immense, beautiful things. There, there is one in the museum, in, Sac in the California Indian Museum in Sacramento. They have uh, some, some Northwest Coast regalia and I think one, if not several, of those dance blades. But look, I think anybody, probably everybody knew how to make stuff, but um, like I'm good at this, you might not be, and going, hey, let me give you a few salmon tonight for for make me a few points. <laughs> this is a uh, rhodacite. It is igneous intrusive, meaning it's part of the volcanic process. You have obsidian on one side, where it cools quickly. This is a little bit slower. And bar the only piece of basalt I have is a biface on the other side, unless you have. Uh, Barb's looking for a piece of uh, uh, basalt for me. Um, so uh, this is again a core. I'm going to try to hit it back here in this. I'm going to try to take this ridge out. But what I really want is that flake behind it that hopefully is, is uh, uh, flat enough that I can actually make something out of it. So let's see what this strike does for me. And I shattered it. This is the salt. And this one even has a uh, interior uh, 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 fracture into this rock. So that's why it, instead of giving me a nice 
play get decided to break also. So, and I think they're actually doing this assaying and taking good flakes um, at the source. I don't think they're taking it home to their villages to figure out that the flake doesn't work. We have in the forest, we have opportunistic quarries where somebody tests it and oh, it's not very good, so they don't. Um, and then the better stuff, they'll preform it, they'll shape it down a little bit more uh, to make it easier to carry home. You're not carrying home a, a five pound rock. Um, if you're close to the source, then yeah, you would take more away. Barf, nothing's working. <laughs> it's camera shy. <laughs> Try a piece of chert? I might try it. Chert isn't my favorite thing to work with. I realize it's the the native material here, uh -huh. but it's just she's she's left her purse, sir. Oh, okay. So that's not too bad, but that side doesn't help me. So I'll see if I can't get the next next flake off here that. Can do something and you see, this. you've got interior and exterior, you've got cortex, um, the outer cortex. rind of the stone, the cortex, um, that tells you what stage, if that's present in some form, um, tells you what stage of manufacture. It's very early in the manufacturing material of a tool, how much cortex you have. And all this that I'm doing here is just to try to again prep that this next strike to this. Better, but not much better. Jeez, Kurt. It's not your fault, it's the rock's fault. <laughs> okay. But it's not supposed to be so grumpy. <laughs> it's the weather. Oh, okay. You know, after after our fires was when I first got here, I'll take as much rain as we can get. I spent uh, so my second year here, and we burned thirty thousand acres on the Mill Fire, and then we then in August we burned forty thousand acres on the North Pass Fire. Well, he's trying to get. Yeah, he's trying to. Um, he's trying to get yeah, I, and I am fireline qualified. I'm an FF2 firefighter, so I can actually be on the front line. And my whole job is to protect heritage resources, depending upon if it's a historic site that can be uh, 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 maybe something friable will burn. Maybe we can stay on the outside of that with the line and not burn it, but it all depends. Sometimes you don't have a choice. And that shouldn't have broke through at all. <laughs> As I said, it's nothing is. Why don't you try getting something else so you can start manufacturing the tool down? To well, see if we'll see what this does. So it's not perfect. So I have a lot of work to do to get this ridge out of here. Um, as a really odd flake here that's decided to develop. So I'm going to, again, soft hammer. And so the whole process now is to thin this down. I always thought this was fun as a kid. I could go out and break rock. It's fun as an adult. And be outside, right? Mm -hmm. When I was in graduate school, I would computers were a new thing to me, and they're they're still pretty much a foreign object object for me. Um, but I remember losing ha a paper I had just written, and I was really pissed off. And this is what I went out as I did was was broke broke on a point for a while, and then went in and had to rewrite it. <laughs> Should have learned. The save button early, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I 
So, and these are, are this is a, and as we, we name everything as a, quit laughing, Barb. <laughs> so, so this is a biface thinning flake, and we can look at it and say, yeah, it was struck here, it, the flake went that way, I, and so we can actually figure out what, we might not have the finished tool on site, but we know what they were actually doing. And this is as sharp as a scalpel, so it's really These good. can also become scrapers. The little side flicks can scrape vegetable materials down, hide to some extent. Be very careful. So they want to break rocks now? <laughs> yeah, we want to break rocks. You should tell them not to try it at home. <laughs> Only with mom and dad's permission. And sometimes some of the rocks, particularly the cherts, um, are not very good cherts until they're heat treated or cooked and they would make ovens. They would dig pits down and put a layer of ash, layer of dirt, layer of rock, layer of dirt, more ash, more heat, um, and then build it up, and you would have a small chimney of oven. Um, this changes the molecular structure of the chert um, and makes it more workable, more nappable in a lot of instances. Um, so you'll have it differential luster where it's deliberately cooked, deliberately heat treated um, to prove, improve. Just um, it's different than when a fire comes through and just burns over. Um, all the chirps that I have made stuff out of, they're, they're all heat treated. Yeah. Here's an example of heat treated. It's what we call differential luster, slightly different colorings. I'll pass this around. And it, has, and it feels like wax paper. If you... Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, yes. Is that the one that looks like a scalpel? Yes. Yeah. Do you ever cut yourself while you're doing that? I do, yeah. but I haven't yet. <laughs> today. Um, I, today. I, I have, I have a, a, when I first got here to the forest, um, we did a CASIP, which is a site, site stewardship program that you come, you do a training with the Forest Service, and then you as an individual can go out and keep an eye on some of our sites. Well, I was doing one of these demonstrations, and the first five hits I did were all in to cut me, every single one of them. <laughs> so that's when you know it's a bad day. Yes, yeah, so I was bleeding quite a bit. So what I'm doing is shaping this down. You guys kind of remember the triangular clunky thing, really thick? So that's this whole process, is, is to use the tools to, to shape this, thin it, and try to keep as, as much as the original size as possible. Also depends upon what you, what you have in mind that you're making. So, like, tools, say, 12, 15,000 years ago, what were, what, what, there's a main tool that the... Uh, people were making at that time. Any thoughts? Clovis. He's right on. Paleo. Yeah. Paleo My bro I have a broken Clovis here. Um, it has a flute coming up the back. What about, what were they hunting with Clovis points? Elk? No. Buffalo? No. Mammoth? Columbia Mammoth. Mastodon. <gasps> right. Mastodon, Columbia Mammoth. Columbia Mammoth. So, 12 to, I believe the dates are 12 to 15,000 years ago. Uh, there's a, so, and how they were, what they were doing with those points, we're not sure if they were actually, if it was part of an atlatl, if it was actually a spear, or 
uh, what what that was actually attached to. But the next round, there is another technology that comes. Uh, and what were they? What were they using for uh, casting? Maybe I should say uh, of the next next. Oh, uh, the next. It's a spear, but it's a throwing spear. Uh, and that's why I'm talking uh, at Lattle. I, I, I have heard of you. Have you ever used a deer antler to do any of the That's what these are. These are deer antler tines. And they're used to uh, actually do the final uh, 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 fine flaking, the, the notches. So somebody said said at lateral over here. So at lateral points is a throw is a is a point that would be on top of a uh, throwing spear, and they're kind of a medium sized point. Hey Barb, if you could help, just hold up a few over there. Medium sized points, at lateral points. Yeah, those. So so Barb has a couple of at lateral points, and then. What's the next? Mm -hmm. So, what's the next technology we have for for hunting? Spears. Uh, it's not. That's where I'm going. Arrows. So, arrows were used here, um, and there's different dates. Everywhere from 3,000 years ago to 1,200 years ago. Oh my so, within that time frame, the bow and arrow comes in and is being used in North America. And then, and then Barb, yeah. would you hand me my, my, uh, my broken drill there? So, yes, I broke this about three weeks ago. Our office is moving. And anyway, we, I, I don't want to think about this because it just means I have to buy, make a new one. So this is my shaft if you're thinking about making an, an arrow. So this, think of an arrow this long. This point is actually a chert drill tip. Um, but this is, so they're using glue that they're making from sap of trees, like uh, uh, bull pines, blue pines. I don't remember what they're called anymore. It changed three times while I was gone from California and since I've been back. Um, so they would actually make a glue with a little bit of beeswax and then the, the sap of the, the bull pine, or blue pine, or is it gray pine? Help me, Sarah. Gray pine. Gray pine, thank you. <laughs> so, so the gray pine um, is, is what they're using then to make this glue, but then this is wrapped with sinew. How many of you know what sinew is? Sinew? Sinew. What is sinew? It's sinew is next to the bone. From the bone. The tendons. Yeah. It's like tendons. Yeah, well, yeah, it corrects muscle to bone is really muscle to it, bone. Is what it is. And they, they talk about a back strap, and then this is the, the muscle that goes from here down to your tailbone, and that's what they pull out of animals. Well, that's what this is, is that where you take a really thread-like piece if you do it the old way, you get to chew it. If you don't do it the old way, then you end up putting it in boiling water until it gets soft and then wrapping it down. So, and then let's see here, maybe 45 minutes for the point, eight hours for the shaft, then you have to put your feathers on it. How much time do I have? This is just one. Barb told, said how, that they would go and retrieve these, and that's why, because they, it is just really labor intensive. I'm actually lamenting the fact I have to make a new cash. <laughs> you just can't go to Walmart and get a new one. No, that's cheating. I mean, <laughs> I they don't take credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then bow and arrows come in, as we talked about. And Barb, there's some yeah. smaller I've, ones I've if you would been, help. I've already been holding them up. Okay. And here's a couple of more. And so Different what sizes. happens with the, uh, uh, like the arrow points in time is that the, they get much smaller. There's a, a real, and, and a lot of people call these bird points. 
I can most definitely tell you they were not used at birds. <laughs> um, they're, these are their hunting points for uh, deer and elk, and, and if they need to, in cases of conflict, that's what they're shooting at their neighbor. Sure. So. The small arrow is, um, the larger point is concussion, and then the smaller one is hemorrhaging, is to produce a hemorrhage, so you aim it in the correct places for hemorrhage. They also did other nasty things to points. They also put really deep serrations into them, and as Barb's talking about hemorrhage. I mean, uh, the, on, on my side of the forest, we have a site called Poison Rock, and I was reading the ethnography on Poison Rock, and they say that what happened at that village is that there was a basin up on the rock behind the village where they would take a deer liver that they had teased a rattlesnake with, and the rattlesnake would bite. I have, I have a if you were to start a fire, what do you use? Uh, do you use a piece of the that? And then what other kind of stone do you use to, if you were trying to start a fire? A oh, we would use the flint. flint. The flints were often used in the East. The flint striking against a piece of steel, okay. metal, or him. Um, um, Steel, flint and steel, uh, in contact periods, flint and, um... Uh, it's, you see my brain... <laughs> uh, actually, flint and hematite. Hematite. Hematite is actually a yeah. metal that would spark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the hematite. Oh. So my, my, poison, my poison story here is, so that's what they would do, is, is, is have a rattlesnake... And, and there you have some dust coming off of your... The, the, is it dead from the, the piece of horn that you have in your hand there? Or a rock, or the lighter, lighter rock, whenever you're darkening the Oh, oh, yeah, yeah it'll, it'll, it'll come yeah. apart. So as the, the snake would bite this, this liver, then they would go put it up in this basin, and, and it would be left in the sun, and it would just ferment, and then what they would do is go and roll their arrows into that poison, oh. and use those against their enemies. Like, like curari in the sun, yeah. Correct. Yeah. But anyway, the name of the village is Poison Rock, and that's why. <laughs> and it's even called Poison Rock in their language. So anyway, it's shaping up all right on this side. Oh, look at that. However, the other side still looks like this. <laughs> so I have a little bit of work to do. And, and to work on that other side, I have to get, if you look at this as half, I have to be on that side of this half of this point for me to actually start taking flakes over the other direction. If not, then you just get step fractures. I still didn't try to thin this out more. And a point can break any time. It's for any reason. Too much pr uh, of a uh, force from hitting it to um, internal fractures to... And we'll try not to do that. Because that, that just hinged. Barb talked about hinges. This, uh, that point, that strike didn't have enough force, so that came in and, and, that, and it just kind of curled and flipped back out oh. right here. And so that just hinged, that's a hinge flake. And it's not very, <laughs> it's one of those oopses that it's really hard to get around when that hinges. Yeah. So I can't 
hit from that direction anymore, yeah. or it'll just keep hinging. Yeah. No. He, 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 it broke. He hit it. Didn't hit it correctly, and it it formed that hinge. Yeah, it wrapped yeah. around and it formed that yeah, hinge. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but mm -hmm. that was a hint. See, it's a deep hinge, and that's hard to get rid of. How big of a piece do you start with when you do those little tiny ones? You know, do you hit your fingers more often that way? No, actually, the smaller ones, I'm using these tools for the most part mm -hmm. and in my hand. Yes, pressure. Pressure flaking to, yeah. Is that one back? Yeah, that one's back. Um, can you, do you want to try taking one of the flakes and maybe doing some pressure flaking? Yep. With the smaller? Show some of the other tools. Sure. I usually try to get a, a nicer, smaller flake here off of something. Mahogany obsidian is my favorite if I can. Get something off of this real quick. Why is it your favorite? <laughs> it's it's red. It <laughs> yeah, it, it's color. It's uh, it cooperates. No, I don't think anything's cooperating. <laughs> it's a lot rarer to have mahogany obsidian. It's it's a more common. You um, welcome. What it is is as the obsidian flows, as the lava flows, it goes over an iron deposit and picks up the red. That's how you get the different colors of the ma uh, materials um, as they cool. And uh, so it's just, it's not as common, but it is so pretty. So this is a really nice flake that I just took off of this. Yeah. I mean, it, I wish the other one would have been <laughs> That's because you told me rock. You loved it. <laughs> You're my favorite. Yeah. Well, it was red, we too, and I still broke it. So, <laughs> anyway. So, this still needs a little bit of, of shaping. This is a, another soft hammer. It's not as big as the moose one here. This is actually mule deer. So, this came off out of his head like that. Yeah, and these are castings. They're they're not shot animals to have the rounded bases. There. Oh. Okay. So they they've dropped these in the fall, mm -hmm. and somebody picked them up, found them. trying to do is, is kind of rough up this edge, kind of shape it more into a kind of like a point. And you guys have my permission. If I pick up those things and not have that on, and yell at me. <laughs> And people ask, well, why don't you wear gloves now? I can't feel what the, what the material's doing. Uh, it's either wear, wear the gloves and not, don't cut yourself, or fill the material, maybe cut yourself or maybe not. Well, how long have you been doing this? <laughs> since, since, I was eight not, years old. since I was eight to nine, <laughs> and I don't want to tell you how old I am. <laughs> so, and so, I'll be fifty-six in August. Almost fifty years. Yeah, isn't that scary? <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> So my whole thing here is just to kind of shape it down. It's not shaping real well. So notice I have this pad. This this is a hand pad. Put your goggles on. Yep. 
Yeah. Now you get but, the yeah. serious yeah. stuff. Yeah, now, uh, uh, Barb's already said, remember the goggles. So. Yeah. so, this piece of leather protects my hands from this next process. So I put the, the obsidian here between these two pads. The one, the lower pad protects my hand from shoving obsidian and, and the, the antler tine into it. The other one holds it down, the flap on top holds it in place. Obsidian before lasers was used in eye surgery. Um, clean, sharp, sterile incision and didn't take long to heal at all. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Don Crabtree had his surgeon get one of the obsidian knives he had made for him and do the primary incision with the obsidian knife when he did his appendectomy. His personal doctor did his appendectomy. They still tell that story today. But a clean, sterile incision. It's, vulcan it's glass. It's volcanic glass. And the glass is used, I mean, we even use bottles if we have to. Um, because you can see the flaking, you can see the scarring very, very well. It doesn't always show up as well in the basalts, the rhyolites, the chirps, um, and the other cryptocrystalline silicates, which is the flints, jaspers, chalcedonies, um, as well as in the glass, in the volcanic glass. And if you still play Trivia Pursuit, the oldest tool making is glass, volcanic glass obsidian. <laughs> uh, Barb, I actually have a piece of blue glass over there that yeah. I was playing with once upon a time. Is this more like chiseling instead of hitting? What he's doing is he's working the edges to make a point here. He's playing with a pe piece of Pepto Bismol to <laughs> model. So, so what this is is I'm actually putting the sampler tine into the side of the glass, and I'm pushing in and under, and I don't. I'm sure you didn't see that flake, but it hit me in the chin. <laughs> As I said, it's, if I'm not wearing my goggles when I start this, somebody used to yell. And even this process, um, the tines, sometimes the, the obsidian has just enough of a rounded edge that I can't get a good bite. What he's doing is he's pressure flaking and he'll make an edge, a sharpened edge for the tool to become a scraper. This is. Obviously not, but you could use it for a small portion, for a scraping tool, uh, chopping the, the vegetables, the vegetation, um, hide work, things like that when you're starting to reduce down and um, do specific notching off the sides. And again, those produce distinctive flakes um, so that you know that you're reshaping a tool, you're making a point, you've got notching flakes, you're making a... Um, corner notched or side notched um, point to uh, put on an arrow, put on a um, spear shaft of some sort, um, those different kinds of things. And again, when we're done here, you can come up and look at everything. Uh, we don't begin to pass everything around, so, but you're welcome to come up and look and talk. So how, how long has, how old is this? process the beginning of time <laughs> when people figured out yeah. if you cut you can catch them you can eat it yeah. <laughs> and eating is good so so it really but it really has evolved over time and yeah. yes and some and of time the chronologies and it's any, fascinating any of it in the prehistoric time you have some some ribbon flaking and side by side flakes that are produced in the same manner and the points are just unbelievably beautiful. It's Does it just make you drool when you Absolutely. see it? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, the, I mean the, the process and the skill and working with the different materials is, I, I mean, I grew up in obsidian country and as an archaeologist and a flint napper that I go to different areas, it's like I need to understand what these people are doing. And I notice my points I make start being re, uh, reflected in, in what I'm seeing on the ground. 
So your process is evolving. Sure, uh, it would evolve with any any mm -hmm. anyone doing plant napping. So the the flake that I took off, I do another round here on it. It's it's actually gone through a transformation of of uh, getting more triangular, uh, a little more, a few more flakes. Um, I just uh, narrowly missed putting a very large flake through my finger. <laughs> yeah, so far I'm good, but uh, I've had a couple of close calls that could have been bad. And what I'm doing is uh, flaking on one side and flipping it over to take a kind of a similar flake from the other side, which gives me a platform to take the next flake. And that's where you get the bi face, the two two sides, two faces. I guess if cracking, if your children's cracking their knuckles gives you a bad time, or, or, or <laughs> you probably shouldn't be a flint actor. <laughs> so one of the things, Barb, that, uh, and I haven't talked about, is like all these subsidian locations. Each obsidian source has its own chemical makeup. So we can actually send this off to have it studied. And what they do is uh, uh, excite it with uh, x-ray. They look at the spectrum of light coming off of it. And they can tell you where this obsidian came from. Oh, yeah. Obsidians in California are um, unique and um, well studied. And they um, also know um, you can get a um, relative dating off of the obsidian. Uh, it absorbs water at different rates, obsidian, once you start to work it. And if you think of it as like tree rings, fat tree rings or good wet years, skinny, you have rings or microns. And you can tell the wider and the bigger, the longer the microns, the older it is. So you have a relative dating. You don't have a precise dating, but you have older, younger uh, within a site. And you pretty much know when when the explosion occurred. Pardon? And do you pretty much know when all of the explosions occurred? Um, or the flows? Yeah, the flows over time. So that's the, so this is kind of a, a blank preform, uh, it's kind of shaped, it has some uh, minor flaking uh, on it, uh, it's on its way to being something. So this is in the stage of like Barb's uh, Riker Mount out here, the two middle top one, uh, on the way to being something over here on the far, the far end. I was looking for this one. She's going to want to try something else for today. I think I started this. I'd like to flip. So this is that biface I was working on earlier. Um, Barb asked me if I want to work on something else. I, I, I guess a little bullheaded here. But I really, I may take two strikes on this. And my whole thing is to take this ridge out and, and thin this down a little bit better than what it is. And there again, I'll either break it in half or maybe I can remove those two. No, two flakes off of it. 
And so there's one, and it actually went from here three quarters of the way over, and here's that ridge that I said I wanted. That's the flake that took it out. Wow, I can see through the edge. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so with that, I was able to, to thin this down further, like I said, I wanted to, to take out, out that, that ridge. But it also, it, it's a lot of time and understanding what your material is going to do when you uh, actually start reducing it. And that was a good flake. So I just hit it here on this, this point. And that's the, the, the flake that just came off of that. And so, so it came off of right in here. And you can see how, how weirdly lopsided where this is really much thinner here. And this still is really thick here. So this is thin in here. And it was this thick. And then this is that last flake that I just pulled. So here's a really, here, here's for your basket weaving, and now you have to make what would they, we, we were just down at the Mono Museum and had a little bit of a demonstration. They call that string when they shave down those, the pieces of vegetable matter that they use to, to weave the baskets. And she's talking about using a pocket knife, and my brain there, I'm thinking originally you would have been using really small flakes like this to, to make those really small, thin uh, 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 weaving for the baskets. One more, and I'll see if I can find something else to play with. And yeah, it might not give me one more without breaking it in half. And you're right, Barb, I think I'm okay. giving up. <laughs> so anyway, I'll let you let that go out and around. So do you have any, any other questions for us? Sure. Uh, you always refer to the ones or whatever as points. When did it come about that we call them arrowheads? <laughs> well, well for, for me, technology, we, we call them all points. Yeah. Um, even like the, the larger stuff is just bifaces. Uh, anything with a point on it, I, I refer to either a point. Um, by calling something an arrow point, I'm giving it function. But it might not be like the, the drill pin point. Um, I know it's a drill because that's what I made it for and that's, that's what it is. But if you find it in an archaeological record without doing study, you're actually giving process and activity to something you really don't know what that was used for. We usually refer to them as projectile points. We don't specifically say spear, arrow. Um, usually, though, the smaller ones were to have been. You don't put a really large point that you would have had on a spear, try to put it on an arrow. It, it doesn't. Doesn't Please don't well. try that at home. It really doesn't work. We'll save you a step. And the little notches on the sides, then that's to run, to run the seam and sinew over. Right. Yeah. Correct. To hold it on. Yeah. Is that right? Oh, the yeah. red one's it's going Okay. I don't have another one that's kind of prepped, or I would. Barb? In that tray, do you see something that's almost finished as far as the arrow point that maybe I can notch? Something that won't take too much. So this is kind of a blank. It's really pretty see-through stuff. This is glass from, uh, I'm sure it's from the Warner Mountains. It's kind of more of a, a blank, but what I'm going to try to do here is serrate the side and you use the same process to notch. So I'm now using this really finer notcher. It has this really narrow wedge here. Oh, thank you. I'm being war <laughs> wait, reminded. Glasses. glasses, Kurt. Before I get too carried away. Yeah, and this is where I would throw one of them to my eyes because I'm going to be working like right here. 
So the process is to come in on this edge and you take the flake one way, you flip it over, and you take a flake out at the same location as that one, and you and you put a so I don't know if you guys can see that notch, but I'm gonna try to do a series of these down this. This type of, of points were also made of, and they're just called serrated points. Oops, I just broke that in half. So what I can show you is right here is a notch that I just, just made that would have, if you had a point, two of those on either side, that's how you would actually attach an arrow. And there's all kinds of notching. There's corner notching, side notching, basal notching. And all of it was just to <coughs> attach that point to a shaft. So where did this glass come from your work with now? This one is from Warner Mountains. You can see it's actually like black and white, you know, it's fully clear. Uh-huh. And there's some red actually on the side I have. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, this is from the Warner Mountain. Yeah. You can collect uh, Warner Mountain Obsidian. You can stop into the Forest Service, get a permit, and I think it allows you a five-gallon bucket full of different colors of material that they have open to the public. Hmm. Where is that located? Um, north and eastern corner of the state. So if you go up Redding and then east, you'll come in there. So this one, I actually have two notches here. So if you think the back of this as a uh, as an arrow point, there's two notches here that that they would have to, to wrap sinew through. Do you have what? Oh, you dropped the notching flakes already. Oh yeah. They're very distinct, um, but the length of the notch. The notch flake uh, determines whether it's a corner notch or a side notch or an end notch. Oh, different point styles up there. There's yeah. in, this, in this one, right? Yeah. The corner notch. If you can see those. Corner. Oh, they're so delicate. You guys can look at that one. After. And then here's a basal notch. I'll hold it upside down. There's one with a basal notch. And again, when we're done, come up and look. So this I haven't hit while I've been here today. This is this is chert. It has been heat treated. That's why it has this really weird pink color to it. These edges are really sharp. But what I'm going to do is hit out here on this and try to take a, a flake down this edge. What I'm looking for is not this strike, but a strike after this that will have a, have a better uh, flaking platform for me. So, what is chert again? Chert is a cryptocrystalline silicate. It's in the jasper. <laughs> it's in the jasper flints, cherts, chalcedony family, um, the Franciscan formation of the forest, and most of Lake County is chert. Oh. <laughs> native plant, native material here. Is it a form of obsidian? No, no, no obsidian is volcanic. Um, obsidian, um, basalts, those are um, volcanic. Um, this is a uh, um, pressure flight, uh, pressure treated, um, not sedimentary. Um, it could be sedimentary. Yeah, they could be sedimentary. Um, but more likely they're, um, no, igneous is the volcanics. Um, I'm forgetting my geology, sorry. <laughs> Metamorphic. There we go. Metamorphic, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> is it, it, so this is the chert like related to agate? Yes. 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 Same family. So it's like a semi-precious stone or not? Not chert, no. No. 
It, de it, it depends, depends on the on the church and on how thick it is. Um, uh, actually, Barb, I think I brought it. Well, this is a church, and it's fairly translucent. I I hit this once and got this nice flake out off of it. I don't know what it'll do when I hit it again though. There we go. I actually got another flake off of it, and this one is actually translucent. It's, it's really nice material, but that's that's a really nice shirt. And I grew up with rock hounds and anything that was translucent or clear, they called agate. So if it's red, it is a jasper, but if it's a clear red, then it's a carnelian. I, I mean, I mean, how many names can you give something? So. So this, that's a really nice church, and I think I have another one back here. So this is also uh, a really fine, glassy church, and I'll go ahead and... Can we ask you a question about, from her collection, is that just a piece of rock, or is that likely... Barb can look at it. It's obsidian. So it happens to be our shape, or is it any evidence of being with us? Well, glass... I don't think it was so much work done as it's just been pressured and then it's um, looks more like it's Canocti. So this is chert. Locally. Uh, those edges are pretty sharp. But that's the flake I just tasted. Well, have any other questions for me? Or us? I grew up uh, in the uh, Sand Hills of Nebraska, uh -huh. and I don't even remember any rocks really being there. But our Sunday outings quite often were uh, to take three kids and the mom and dad. We'd go out to the blowouts, you know, because there's quite a bit of wind out there, and spend the whole day looking for arrowheads. And it was, we just had a great time. You know, I didn't think well, it was much in the way of activity, you know, for families or kids or whatever, but I don't remember any rocks being out there in the blowout. And if you're fine, and if, and if what you're finding is finished materials, yeah, it was. Uh, um, they're, they're collecting their material, they could be trading with their neighbors, okay. but they're finishing it someplace May else. It come from somewhere yeah, else. so, so it, it, most likely a habitation site where you guys were picking they're up They're almost material. all black or dark colored. Yeah. And back there, it's mostly chert, yeah. other than the obsidians and stuff. Uh, we actually have obsidian uh, in Yosemite, not Yosemite, um, uh, Hmm. Uh, Yellowstone National <laughs> Park, Yellowstone. and and then to the south, there's obsidians, and some of that was actually traded back into the Midwest. So. There's a flint ridge in Ohio. It's a blue flint, which again is a crypto crystalline right. silicate, one. and uh, it was traded all the way out to Yellowstone. It was prized. The blue, the beautiful blue color, was prized, and it was traded all the way out, at least as far as Yellowstone. Some of these stones are so beautiful. Did they make jewelry out of them? No, not usually. The for here, most of the jewelry that they would make are out of shell and and uh, mostly shell. Some soapstone or or other materials. I kind of have have this one display here. So. Like she asked about about other other things. So of course we know our abalone friend here, but they would make they would make pendants. They would shape them, get, and there's actually a hole here I drilled with that. So by spinning that in my hand, this is 45 minutes to go through one side. Wow. <laughs>
just to get through the other side, then to flip it over to spin it again for probably another 15 minutes to get a hole like this. Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah, um, I had a comment about uh, Ishii. Uh -huh. um, uh, mm -hmm. When they brought him to live at the Anthropology Museum in San Francisco, mm -hmm. on Sundays the tourists would bring him beer bottles mm -hmm. and he would make arrowheads. And I've seen a beautiful cobalt blue um, arrowhead that he made out of a uh, milk and magnesia bottle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So. Hmm. Again, the glass, mm -hmm. the volcanic glass or glass bottles really show the work, show the beauty the best. So we use a lot of the obsidian um, for demonstration so we, that we can show the finer points, the notching, the different types of flakes. Um, but turk here is the predominant tool type. Um, they did have the obsidian. The obsidian was used. Uh, we have the beautiful Borax Lake, we have the Canuck Dye, which other people claim was, I guess you've got to find the best pieces of it. Um, and then of course traded in was Napa, uh, further north in the forest, the Medicine Lake, Grasshopper Flat was being done south, the Tuscan is also a further northern, um, being traded down, uh, different times trade routes um, or tra and or trade partners um, disappeared, so other materials had to be found, other routes, other ma things had to be found for, for working. Um, but the Borax Lake site, which is a national um, landmark site, our Borax Lake over here, um, is a highly prized source. So, uh. I had a question. Sure. Uh, years ago, we had a pond dug for our vineyard and uh, came up with a, a very nice, um, well, either a spear point or an arrowhead. I forget. We took it to an expert here and he said it was a Mostyn point. What do you know about the Mostyn points? Mostyn points are made from the, uh, are defined by the site type Mostyn site, uh -huh. which is over on Clear Lake, uh, Kelsey Creek. Oh. Uh, I cannot remember the times up, time out now. now. Um, site types, rattlesnake point. The rattlesnake island mm -hmm. had a definitive small point type that now is termed rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. um, and these different typologies are used over time and they're just, as they were first found at such and such a site, they're given that name and then they the name follows through with the typologies. Mm -hmm. So when the you know, you don't always be able to photograph and draw every artifact, every point in a site, but you could say the rattlesnake po points, the Mosden points, and other archaeologists will have an idea of what that point looks like. He told us it was probably around the clan of the cave bear, about 12,000 years old. Is that possible? <clears throat> um, the Borax Lake site is the earliest undisputed site in California, and it's over 15,000 years old. Yeah. So it wouldn't have been named after the Mostyn family. <laughs> no, it is. Well, the site when it was found was on Mostyn property then, and that's when it was termed Mostyn's, Mostyn Point. So we were kind of talking about abalones for, for uh, uh, adornment. This is a, a Washington clam from from the coast over here, mostly out of Bodega Bay and, and Humboldt. And what they were doing here with these is shaping them down to a round. This is biconically grilled. So that's I'm just, with that uh, uh, hand drill that I showed you. Then they would put them all together, strings of them, and roll them. And this is what in this country are called clamshell disc beads or money beads. And up here on this display, you have one of these shells yeah. in the top far right, and a strand of these are over there on the, uh, down and to the left on that small panel. The other bead that's over there are olivella beads, and this is an olivella shell. And what they would do is actually um, <coughs> bake them to make them kind of a cream color. These have been baked. 
I baked them. And then what they, because they originally look like this, so you bake them and they look like this. And this is the color they wanted. But then what they would do is, if I have one, they would then either find them with the, the spire, the tip, ground, or they, then they would grind them themselves. And then these are uh, spire lopped olive villa beads. And they're in this display. Uh, it's the necklace with the uh, uh, banjo or big head pendant on it. So those are the uh, two. And then also in this area, they had magnesite. And the older lady that was here talked about magnesite. And they would make beads out of those, either wafer beads or long beads. And, and they would bake them. And they turn purple or salmon or sometime even more red. And this is money. Uh, the further away these beads get, the more valuable they are. I have beads here that are, uh, these are dentelium shell. They are from uh, Vancouver Island. Uh, this is money for the people on our northwest coast, California. And these, there's a picture of Sitting Bull's wife and on her yoke of her dress has thousands of these going around for this one. So uh, I know that this, these came into this area. They would be highly prized, how highly valuable for these people. They, somebody might have one or two. Oh but not like our Northwest Coast where those people have strings of, of, of then tell him shell beads. That's all I have deed-wise here. Oh, trade beads. Uh, these are family pieces. Um, I have a couple white hearts here. So they're pomegranate red. I know they're small. Uh, they have white centers. Whoops, one escapee. And more escapees. I'll have to see what I draw. Um, but the beads uh, are European manufacturer. These are uh, probably uh, 1850 to 1860, and this was part of a bag that belonged to my family. And my grandma said, here, you'll do something with these someday, and meanwhile, I still haven't done anything with them. And then also, these are 1870. This is a, a, a Russian facet trade bead. It's also off of the same bag. It's about 1870. So the beads that were sold, that sold Manhattan Island, really must have been cool beads. Well, they didn't have the color because you're talking about the East Coast. They're still making beads out of uh, shell and some stone and maybe copper. And then all of a sudden you have these these really beautiful colors. I mean, I, I, I'd be... Um, I still am. I, I'm still pretty infatuated with trade beads. They're pretty good, cool things. So this is actually one of the larger pieces I've ever made that's actually uh, uh, pressure flaked on both sides and so on. I'll let you guys take a look at this. Did I answer your questions about beads and adornment? Mm -hmm. um, they, any, uh, on, the, on the forest, there's a, a pendant that we found a few years ago before I got here, actually, that actually has uh, two holes drilled on both sides. Um, it's, I'm not, I think it's a, a, we call it a schist, but it's kind of like a, a soapstone, but it has some metallic flakes in it, and, and it just kind of sparkles. And I think they would find things that they liked and make make stuff out of it if they can. Oh, yes. thank you, Mark. Uh, escapees. I think I'm done. <laughs> Unless you guys want to be, I'll, I'll flatten up a little bit. Uh, help yourself. Look at. Stuff that I've that I've made and 
uh, Barbara and I are here to <laughs> answer questions that you may have or whatever you like to do. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> The library again for having us and yes. us back. Yeah, thank you very much. I wanted to tell everybody we're doing um, book to action if anybody wants a free book. A man called Ogan. What so, I'm um, sorry, what did you say? We're having a book to action program where you can come and get a free book at the front desk. And I wanted to let everybody know if they wanted a book to ask at the front desk. And I wanted to thank the U.S. Forest Service for lending us Barbara White and Curtis Fick there to come and show us today. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.